Giraldi with Creating Conversations in Redondo Beach in California. And I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk about the contributions of women in history, um, fictional, non-fictional, and sort of in between. And uh, our, our guests tonight are Natasha Lester, and Natasha is the New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Seamstress, The Paris Orphan, and The Paris Secret. And she's a former marketing executive for L'Oreal. When she's not writing, she loves collecting vintage fashion. Dior is a favorite. Practicing the art of fashion illustration, learning about fashion history, and traveling to Paris when that's allowed. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she lives with her husband and three children in Perth, West Australia. And I do want to note that Creating Conversations has a very limited supply of the custom book plates and tote bags available to readers who purchase her latest, The Riviera House, through us. And it has a stunning woman in a blue dress illustration that Natasha made. And so I am delighted to see you in your blue sweater for the occasion. I did work that out well, didn't I? I didn't even think of that. <laughs> it was all <laughs> organized. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Deliberate choice. And tonight she will be in conversation with Mary Kay Eater. Uh, she is a retired U.S. Army Major General, a renowned speaker and author, and a thought leader on strategic communication and leadership. General Eater is the former commanding general of the U.S. Army Reserve Joint and Special Troops Support Command, former Deputy Chief of the Army Reserve, and former Deputy Chief of Public Affairs for the U.S. Army. She is the author of Leading the Narrative, The Case for Strategic Communication, published by the Naval Institute, in, published by the Naval Institute Press. And she collected and highlighted women's accomplishments in The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, untold stories of the women who changed the course of World War II. So this is the core that connects the two of you, which is stories of women who made contributions. And while Natasha is writing fiction and Mary has collected nonfiction, um, there is a nonfiction inspiration to part of the Riviera House. So uh, I'm gonna step back and let the two of you converse and then, um, uh, in a little bit, I'm going to uh, feed questions to you. If people have questions, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the two little conversation bubbles for the Q&A, and you can pop your questions in there, and I will direct them to our guests when uh, they finish their conversation. So uh, without further ado, uh, please take it away. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mary Elizabeth. And hello, Mary. It's lovely to actually speak to you. We've emailed, but we haven't met and we're still yeah. not really meeting in real life, but this is the next best thing at the moment, isn't it? It is, sadly. And I know, I know. And thank you so much to everyone who has joined us for this evening um, or this morning, as it is my time here in Australia. So Mary and I thought that we would just talk, um, ask each other questions back and forth for the next 25 minutes or so about our books. We're gonna kick off by just giving a brief summary of what our two books are about, just to give some context to the rest of the conversation. So I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about the Riviera House before I ask Mary to tell us a little bit about the girls who stepped out of line. So the Riviera House, beautiful cover there, is about a young woman called Eliane who is working for the Louvre in Paris in 1939 to support her family of four sisters and one brother. Then when the Nazis occupy Paris, she's forced to leave the Louvre and she's asked to move to work at a different museum in Paris called the Jeux de Pomme. On her first day working at that museum, as she approaches the building, she sees that it's guarded by armed Nazis, which she thinks is very unusual for an art museum. And then when she walks in through the doors, she realizes that gathered in this museum is a collection of artworks that's so astonishing. It's more valuable than the kind of exhibition any of the largest art galleries in the world could ever put on display. 
She has no idea where the artworks have come from, why they're there and where they're being sent to. And thus begins Eliane beginning to work on a dangerous mission with the French resistance to spy on the Nazis who are thieving artworks from the Jewish families of France during the Second World War. So that's in a nutshell what the Riviera House is about. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about the girls who stepped out of line? Well, there are connections between, I think, the story in your book and some of the stories in mine. Mine is stories about 15 very different women who lived during this time period and who did a variety of jobs, missions, careers during World War II. Now, one was in the resistance in France, um, just as your characters were. So I, I really enjoyed that little bit of crossover there. But I'll tell you, when I found these stories, I decided that I needed to just put them all together. And then I found the ways in which they seem to connect. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about the jobs. It's about the life lessons. And I think that's what we get in common from both of these books is incredible life lessons about how you can be challenged, how you can take a risk, mm -hmm. how you step out of line, how you make a difference and how you do the right thing. And that was what I learned so much about from reading the Riviera House and was fortunate to be able to do so and saw how it intersected so clearly with some of the stories that I told. Mm. Yeah, it's a per the perfect book for our time right now. I think those kinds of stories that are very inspirational where we're all looking for good, positive stories that can help lift our mood, particularly when the world seems to be, you know, turning into a very bad place at the moment in so many different ways. So um, it is also a really wonderful book. And before we start talking specifically about some of the elements in The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, I wondered if, because you've got such a fascinating background, you've done so many different things with your service and then moving into writing books as well. So I wondered if you could actually share with everybody here a little bit about your background, because it is so interesting and how that led you into then becoming a writer as well. <clears throat> well, I think that for all of us, we find the things that we start out doing in life and then how to use them as a basis for going on to do other things. So much of my background is originally in journalism, you know, in public relations, and then continuing to write in different ways, whether it's expository writing, journalism. And then once I left the military, starting to write fiction. And so as I'm starting to write fiction, I'm thinking, well, I have other stories I want to tell too. So as I began to find some of these elements, I'm telling them in ways like you would write fiction. Mm -hmm. So they're expository, but they're accessible. So many of the, I think, nonfiction pieces about World War II you read can be written in a way that are very dry and academic. And I wanted to make these accessible. So that was part of my bringing journalism into how I prepared these stories. And so it worked for me and I hope it works for people who read them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. It's so wonderful to have these women kind of brought to life rather than just be written about in a kind of very flat and lifeless way, as you often do find in a very strict nonfiction kind of piece. Yes. And for you, it's, it's the background in fashion and that world and how you bring that into these books in a way that is just so compelling. I'll tell you, as I read the Riviera House, I had beside me, well, I'm reading it in, in the book format, but I have the iPhone next to me so I can look up terms, so I can look up um, terminology from art, so I can look up terminology about fashion and think about there are places where you can go to buy vintage fashion and flea markets I want I want to go there so can you talk about how you were able to transfer this love into being able to write about it of course so as you said you know you start off doing something and it's amazing where those experiences can take you and for me, I was the kind of kid who was always writing stories and books and poems. And I, want, I had that love of writing from a very young age. Um, but, you know, being a writer was something, a, a concept that I couldn't quite understand how to do. So I ended up 
doing a marketing degree at university and working in marketing for L'Oreal in the cosmetics mm. side of things for quite a number of years, which was super fun. I had more lipsticks than anyone could ever wear in a lifetime, <laughs> which for a young woman in her 20s was great. Um, but as much as I loved it, it wasn't, you know, my passion. And so it wasn't until I was kind of um, moving across Australia to the other side of the country and having to leave my job at L'Oreal behind that, I had this opportunity to kind of start again, I suppose. I had to quit my job. I was suddenly unemployed. I could go and look for another job in mm. marketing, but I decided to try to do something about this love of writing that I still had. So I went back to university, did a writing degree and began writing from there. And over that time too, I lived in London for a few years. And mm. I remember vividly, there was this vintage clothing shop on the King's Road in Chelsea called Steinberg and Tolkien. And I used to walk past it a lot. And then I started going in there every weekend. And she had the most amazing treasure trove of garments from these delicate 1920s, even 1910s pieces she had in there. I saw a poire um, from the 1910s in there once, which I just about died because it was so incredibly valuable and delicate and gorgeous. And I just... I never, couldn't afford to buy any of it at that point in time. And I just would go and wander through and kind of absorb the gorgeousness and the beauty. And then I would go to the V&A Museum and the museum up at Bath, those beautiful costume collections mm. that they have there. And so that um, love of fashion, I guess, developed then. And it wasn't until I started writing historical fiction that I started in my first couple of books, just every time the characters were wearing a piece of clothing, I would actually go and research a genuine garment from the times. And from there, I suddenly thought, well, wow, why don't I actually just make this a bigger part of the storyline? Because I love writing about it so much. Readers seem to enjoy it. There isn't that much um, historical fiction that has a bit of a fashion storyline through it. So it make, made sense to combine this passion for historical fashion in with my passion for historical fiction. And luckily, readers seem to enjoy it. So hopefully it's something I can you know, keep doing um, as, as I keep writing more books because um, yeah, I love doing it. Yeah. It adds so much, I think, to have your personal passion come yes. through in the story you tell. Yes, and absolutely. Also, so intrigued with how you found Rose Valland. And I know you, you mentioned going to Paris. So can you talk about how you found her there? Yeah, so Rose Valland, I actually came across her when I was researching my previous book, The Paris Secret. I um, was reading Anne Seba's book, Les Parisiennes, How the Women of Paris Lived, Loved and Died in the 1940s. Mm which is about the experience of Parisian women during the Second World War. And she mentions Rose Valland in there. And I was immediately fascinated by the idea of a woman who had risked her life for art during the Second World War. So many stories that we hear about the French resistance are about the people who worked really courageously to save human beings, whether they be you know, downed um, allied pilots or Jewish families, Jewish children, et cetera. And so here was a slightly different perspective on, you know, saving something precious during wartime. So I started to dig into Rose's story and um, just to kind of summarize that for people who may not have heard of Rose, um, she was uh, the art, the curator at the Jeux de Prod Museum in Paris um, during the Second World War until the Nazis occupied the city and they took over the museum and they began to systematically steal every collection, private collection of artwork held by the Jewish families in France. And they transported all of those artworks, so from families like the Rothschilds to the Jeux de Pont Museum, around 20,000 pieces of art in total. And then they had art historians working there who would catalogue all of the stolen artworks and then transport them out on private trains to Adolf, to Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goring. They were mm -hmm. sending them to hiding places on the way to then enhance the, collect the art collections of, of Goring and Hitler. And Rose saw what was happening and being an art lover and, and understanding how precious art is to inspire us and as part of France's cultural heritage, she decided to pretend she didn't speak German and so then she spied on all of the conversations the Nazis were having in the gallery. She wrote down the names of all the paintings that had been transported to the art gallery, who they were stolen from, the name, so that they, she had this hope that at one point in time, obviously she didn't know this, mm -hmm. we know this looking back on it, that the war ended, but she didn't know at the time that it would. She had this hope. <laughs> There's our friendly puppy in the background. I love that. 
um, she had this hope that the war would end and at some point in the future she would be able to help restore those artworks to their rightful owners and and she did she participated in that after the war and you know without her it's certain that so many more thousands of artworks would have been lost there are still pieces missing but she certainly helped to restore yes. so many artworks to their rightful owners she was a really courageous woman you know she risked her life she was often in fact Colonel Von Burr who ran the, the museum he at one point threatened to take her to the border and liquidate her so she was you know under threat of her life the whole time but she just mm -hmm. kept going and going and going and thank goodness she did really um so she was pretty remarkable but you've also written about some incredible women women in your book um and I, I wondered about um, where you found some of these women, because some of them I had heard of and some of them I had never heard of, and their stories were extraordinary to me. And I wondered whether they were women you had heard of throughout your lifetime or whether you specifically went searching for examples and you found them in your research, or how did you come by the 15 women who you decided to write about in The Girls Who Stepped Over the Line? A few of them I had heard about. Some mm -hmm. of them are well known regionally or were known to their families or were known, I think not in a, in a national or international way, but at least in a smaller way. So <clears throat> actually I began to read obituaries and oh. I know how that sounds, but <laughs> in, as we come to 2019, the members of the greatest generation are passing in ever greater numbers. Mm -hmm. So as I'm reading, even these short obituaries, I'm seeing incredible stories that I know there's much more to them. Mm -hmm. So I started to save them. Mm -hmm. And then I began to seek out more. So I'm beginning to put these together and think of how I can do something with them. Mm -hmm. Some I couldn't find more on. I couldn't find family members to speak oh. with. Or I must let this dog out. <laughs> I have three small children, so we're lucky they're not in the background. We've just got a dog today, so that's not too much to contend with. <laughs> so embarrassing. But the door wasn't really open far enough for him. That yes, and they do help me with all of this writing and let of me know it's time to take a break. <laughs> Valuable writing partners. <laughs> so I so I found obituaries, I found great stories. Some didn't come to fruition because I couldn't find enough material. Mm. Others, I felt like people didn't want to be found mm. or recognized. And in others, I was simply blown away by what they did. Mm. Um, two of the people I found who were not fashion conscious were the Cook sisters from London, who were middle-aged spinsters, who were both government typists, and Ida began to write romance novels to earn them a little more money for their, their passion. They were opera groupies. So she and her sister would go to operas whenever they could afford to. And they sewed their own clothes for the most part to dress up and try to look like they were fashion conscious when they went. But they would hang around stage doors. They would ask for autographs. And as they worked their way into this society, they became well known. And when one of their friends, a orchestra conductor said, would you please help one of my friends just escort her back to London? Why certainly. They didn't know they were helping a Jewish refugee escape. So they eased into this mm -hmm. and began to help others move and escape. But you had to prove that you were financially solvent to come into Britain at the time. And most people put their money into what was portable whether it was furs or jewels, art was too large. So here they come in their Woolworth sweaters and their sensible shoes wearing on the, on the train or on the plane on the way back, gigantic diamond brooches and furs. Mm. And they carried it off because they had great faith in their British passports and in their own ability to do what they believed they could within their means. Mm. And I was just amazed by that. And, they didn't realize they were how courageous they were at the time. So I love those stories. And, and again, the way in which they did it was just incredible. Mm. Yeah, I love that image of them in their fur coats and their, their extraordinary, extravagant jewelry um, doing these remarkable things that nobody knew they were doing um, until later. It's quite incredible. 
there was one scene where they were on a train and one of the conductors was suspicious. And he said to Ida, so where did you get those earrings? And she said, what's the matter? Don't I look good in these? What, <laughs> I'm not attractive enough to wear these earrings. And she practically chased him down the hallway. And so there was no more suspicion. She chased him until he ran away. Absolutely. I love that story. <laughs> Wonderful woman. Yeah, so, so many of these stories I found are not about the job. So, so they were all different uh, people from different walks of life in different countries doing a variety of things. It's about the life lessons you learn when you take a risk, when you say, I will, I will help, I will do this, I will take on a challenge, even if, even if you don't know what it means at the time. And mm -hmm. that's what I liked about it the most in writing mm -hmm. these. Wonderful. So let me ask you a little bit more about the current day story in your book about Remy and her relationship with the people next door and how that story came to be because it ties in so beautifully to the past. Yes, so for readers who've read my previous novels, you know, I do like to juggle a couple of yes. timelines, a historical and a contemporary. And in this time, the contemporary came about because I um, read an article in the New Yorker about the, the Goring catalog, which was a catalog that Herman Goring put together about his collection of artwork during the Second World War. And it was largely the pieces that he thieved. He had some art prior to the war, but his collection expanded tremendously as he began to steal artworks. And this catalog had a link to Rose Valland. She had actually come by it in around 1946, historians think, um, but had not shown it to anybody. So she had this extensive record of, of everything Herman Goring had stolen, which would have been immensely helpful in her restitution efforts. And she certainly did use it then, but she didn't kind of show it to anybody else. And near the end of her life, she boxed it up with her papers and sent it off to one archive. And then it was sent on to another archive. And it wasn't until the late nineties that her boxes were opened and someone went through the contents and found Herman Goring's art catalog in there. Um, and nobody knows why she kept it a secret. It's a bit of a mystery. And so, that's a mystery that I decided to kind of incorporate and weave into the story of the Riviera House because the catalogue itself was actually published in 2015. And so in the contemporary storyline of my book, Remy, who has gone to this fabulous home on the French Riviera um, to escape a personal tragedy, um, finds a copy of the Herman Goring catalogue, the one that's been printed. And as she's looking through it, she sees in the pages a photograph of an artwork that has always hung on her childhood bedroom wall. And so she has no idea how an artwork that once belonged to Goring could have been in her possession. And so she starts to kind of track down what happened to these artworks mm. during the Second World War, which kind of intersects back to Rose Vallon's story. Um, but that was a really... Um, but there was so much to kind of look into in that part of the storyline and, and part of that was actually going and doing some research on the French Riviera itself. I was actually very lucky when I did my research for that. It was December 2018. We could still travel. COVID was something we had never heard of. And um, I stayed, in fact, in a, a villa that was once owned by F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald um, in Antibes, which was quite, you know, for a writer, like, could you find a more inspiring place yeah. to stay when you're researching a book? Um, and had one of those fabulous old iron cage elevators where you have to kind of pull mm. the door across and it's creaking and groaning. My kids were terrified of it and wouldn't go in it, but I just loved it. I, you know, just imagining, you know, F. Scott being in the elevator <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> um, but I also, um, I wanted to find the perfect town to set the contemporary storyline of the book in as well. And so I drove into lots of different Riviera villages and towns until I stumbled upon St. John Cap Ferrar, which is the setting in the Riviera mm -hmm. house. And as soon as I drove in, I knew it was perfect. Um, it's got a beautiful, you know, peninsula or cap that kind of extends out from the main town, which is surrounded on, you know, three sides by water. And it has this amazing path carved into the cliff that you can walk around and 
up above the path on the top of the cliff are these magnificent homes that have these staircases carved into the rock face that they walk down to access their kind of private beaches. And I thought, you know, if there's one place in the world to set a part of a book, it's got to be here. Um, so hopefully that's a nice escape for people who perhaps, you know, can't travel at the moment, whilst there is, um, you know, the serious side to the story with the art thefts during the Second World War, there is also hopefully balanced by a slightly more escapist storyline, which is perhaps mm -hmm. what we all need right now, a bit of a chance to escape vicariously to the French Riviera um, in that part of the story. So that yeah. was hugely fun. <laughs> but it's, all, it's always about the people. Absolutely. And I found that I cared about these people. I worried about them when I wasn't reading the book. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I do skip to the end to make sure everyone's okay. <laughs> go back but I didn't do that this time I wanted to go all the way with them through the story and I found that you build tension and you build the story with such patience I was going oh come on can't they kiss already come on. <laughs> oh. but I, I did care about these people I worried about them and I was so enthralled by their journey throughout and and then go back in time and see how all of these things that occurred during that time period influenced and mm. still influence how people act, believe, love today. Yeah. That was the most incredible thing to me. Yeah, it's what it's amazing, isn't it? The legacy that something like war leaves so many years later. And you must have found that when you were researching some of your women and, and speaking to their families. And one in particular I really wanted to ask you about, because I'm quite convinced that I might even like to write about her in a novel at some point, because her story is so gripping. Um, Alice Marble, so you open the chapter in your book with that fascinating chase through the Swiss Alps. Um, she's got the Nazis on her tail and she's, you know, she's being chased literally through the Swiss Alps but before that she has this whole incredible backstory as well she did about a million extraordinary things during one lifetime like she's crammed more into her life than it seems possible for anyone to have done that so can you tell us a bit about Alice Marble who I'm now absolutely fascinated with well Alice Marble was a tennis champion and I had never heard of her until one of my friends knew I was working on this book and said why don't you write about Alice Marble and I said, I don't know who that is because I don't follow tennis. And he said, well, she was a star in the 1930s. She was a amateur tennis player. She won 18 grand slams in the space of six years, which so if you follow tennis, Serena Williams has won 23 and she's played for a very long time. So this is an incredible player. We know without all the coaches and the professional expertise and the help you have today. So about 1940, she decided I need to go pro because she's not earning money. They didn't earn money then as amateurs. Well, that was probably not a great time to choose to go professional and go out on exhibition tours because right after Pearl Harbor, that was no longer possible. So she played exhibition matches during the war. She tried to go into the military. Everyone served in some way, everywhere. Everyone had a uniform of some kind. But because she had had TB when she was younger, she was ineligible. So she found other ways to, I think, be helpful. She did do exhibition matches for the troops. She did find another way to support in that she was asked at a party. So listen, would you support us in this new effort? We're creating a new comic book character, Wonder Woman. And she said, I'd rather be an editor. So she became one of the executive editors for Wonder Woman and helped develop that character, which I was amazed at that. So she does tell the story about being asked to work with army intelligence, find an old boyfriend in Switzerland and spy on him, which she does. She gets information, she takes photographs and then she is chased down, shot and ends up in a hospital. Now. Later biographers say, well, there's no proof this happened. There's no proof it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, there's still a lot of files that are not released that we don't have that we don't know about. And you can find a little bit of this story mentioned in the new biography by Billie Jean King, which I just picked up this last week. 
But after the war, she turns her attention elsewhere. Oh, and she did coach Billie Jean, by the way, when Billie Jean was 16. But right after the war, she talks about Althea Gibson, an African-American player who was not permitted to play in what is now the US Open, playing this weekend in New York, um, because she was, it was segregated. And she fought to have professional tennis desegregated. And she took it on in a very public way and talked to every, everyone in the US Tennis Association about, if you want to talk about being ladies and gentlemen, then let's do the right thing. And she was very successful at that. Her story is incredible. Oh, it is. And I just think it's it's perfect for a novel as well because she has all those different elements and they're all dramatic and exciting. But also, you know, she served this wonderful purpose for the whole community and her activism. So she did, you know, she did everything quite literally from Wonder Woman. I mean, my God, when I read that, I was just like, amazed to yes. being an activist. She was amazing. <laughs> she was. She did it all. Yeah, and she did. <laughs> and it hasn't been talked about for so long. So when I found this story, I was like, I never knew this. And I, I found her biography. So doing yeah. some of the research for this during the pandemic was, mm. I couldn't get into libraries. I couldn't get into museums. So I ended up buying books online mm. or in different places. And I now have a rather large library of <laughs> books that were uh, given up by various other libraries and sold. So I have a good collection if you need any more references for anything from World War II. I think I have a lot of them now. Yeah, I do love buying, um, you know, secondhand books from the 1940s or 50s, the original sources that, you know, you can't get hold of anywhere else. And so like your jam-packed bookshelves behind you, I have similar yes. books on every subject. <laughs> So what do you think is next? Do you want to go back to these characters? Do you see any more story for them? Because I would want to know more about them. I told you, I'm very, very much committed to finding out how they're doing and what's happening with them. Um, I rarely revisit characters in their totality. I do, in all of my books, um, have characters make cameo appearances in subsequent books. So people do tend to reappear briefly. I'm currently writing a book um, that will probably be out next year or early 2023. I'm not entirely sure on the publication date yet, um, but that's focusing on the experiences of women immediately after the Second World War, because yeah. obviously it was a big time of change and a huge disappointment for so many women who had been able to do, you know, gain their independence during the war, had been able to work, earn their money, um, experience life in a way that they hadn't in, you know hadn't comprehended life could be prior to the second world war um and then after the war there were those propaganda campaigns exhorting women to return to the home give up their jobs cook roast dinners for their husbands and i wanted to look at what that might have felt like for some women at that time mm. so mm -hmm. it's told from the perspective of um the director of public relations at the House of Christian Dior, the newly opened House of Christian oh. Dior in Paris in the 1940s. So again, it has a bit of a fashion storyline as well as that kind of feminist storyline mm. that I always like to kind of include in my books too. Um, yeah, so really fascinating period, I think. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to getting that book, book out into readers' hands. Um, but there's one more of your women who I'd love to hear a little bit more about too. Um, particularly because I guess it kind of touches on this um, idea that women immediately after the war weren't recognised for what they did and people forgot about that. You talk about, um, is it Stephanie Czech Radar? Am I saying her name yes. correctly? Yes. yes, great. And, you know, she was nominated for so many accolades after the war. She was a spy, but she never received any of those um, awards that she had been nominated for. And you touch on that in your book. And I wanted, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that you know how much do you think gender played in those decisions and um is that a common thread that you found through your women that you wrote about it is and several of the others i also found they left their service after the war and received nothing and some of that was that generation too so mm. it, it's a combination of things so it's the well we, we don't give those type of awards to women to yeah oh, I don't deserve anything. I just did my job. I just did my bit. 
I, I just tried to contribute. So they didn't seek them. Mm. And then there's also the accidental factors of the OSS was disbanded right at the end of the war. So if you're working in the office that processes awards and here's a stack of them from this organization that doesn't exist anymore, you go, okay, we'll just put those over here. Mm -hmm. And we'll work on the other ones that are more current or more important or their bosses might complain. Yeah. So it can be some of all of these things. So it's intentional and unintentional. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so Stephanie Rader, Stephanie Check, she wasn't quite married yet. Um, <laughs> She married a pilot, a nice pilot she met in London, because she was stationed in the London office of the OSS up until the very end of the war, and then ended up in Austria for a few months before going to Poland. And I only found that out a couple of months ago, as mm -hmm. I found a interview done with her that had never been transcribed, that had never been seen by anyone else. So I asked this museum if I could come in and see it. And so I got to watch it on a screen that was this big in the video camera that hadn't been touched since 1996 when it was recorded. Oh, wow. So in it, she tells about how they met on a blind date in London. Um, and he would tell everyone for years he picked her up on a street corner. And their story, which didn't exist in anything else I had found. So it filled in big gaps for me in her, her story and in her career. So when she left, it was, well, I'm leaving now. Mm. But when you got married, you left. Because that was just how it worked. So mm. she had uh, a army commendation ribbon, which today is a medal, but still was not at the level which she should have received. So mm. there was the fight to get her a larger award. And that didn't occur until actually after she had passed away. In, 29, in 2017, and it wasn't presented until her funeral and given that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even some of the others didn't have awards. So I asked mm -hmm. Betty Robarts, what did you get when you left? And she said, nothing, we didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. Many of them got recognition only 20, 30, 40 or more years later. Mm -hmm. And there is still a fight now in, in America to give the Congressional Gold Medal to the African-American women of this 6888 postal unit because they didn't receive any recognition either. Yeah, yeah. I just read a fascinating novel about that unit as well, actually. Um, I hadn't heard of them until I'd come across Sisters in Arms, the novel is called, and it's, yeah, quite an extraordinary story, actually. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, how, you know, as you mentioned, women were reticent to talk about their war experiences after the war and, and possibly that plays a part in the lack of recognition, um, you know, in Rose Vallon's case, for example, she did write a memoir yeah. about her experiences, but it's it's really all about the jeu de pomme and the artworks and the work involved in tr keeping track of them. And there's very little of the personal in there, um, which is why when I was writing the Riviera House, I decided to um, have another character working alongside Rose who yes. I could invent. I just didn't have enough material about Rose as a person because there's, a, there's literally two occasions in her memoir where she uh, explores her feelings. You know, she mentions once that every time she approached the jus de pomme in the morning and saw the armed guards out the front, she would have this feeling of dread in her stomach. And so that, you know, told me obviously she was very fearful, even though she never presented that face to anybody. And, and also she talks about, at another point, the artworks arriving to the sound of Nazi boots um, in an environment that was run with concentration camp discipline. Mm -hmm. And it's those kinds of descriptors that you start to gain an understanding of how she really did feel there, but she never writes about that. And it's very, you know, reticent to put herself as a person on the page. So, you know, again, but that, that obviously tells you something about her character too. So when I was writing her into the Riviera house, I was conscious of the fact that she was private. She was the kind of person who preferred to, you know, keep things to herself. And, yes. you know, she wasn't expressive when it came to her feelings. So that in a way does help you to create the character too. But yeah, very emblematic, I think, of women at that time who, who didn't talk about um, those things that they did and the things that happened. And, you know, they didn't blow their own trumpets, I suppose, I yes. guess you could say. Very, very self-contained. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the exact could... right phrase. <laughs> But she had a big effect with everything she did, just as all of them who were 
in the background in that way. They're, they're the ones who got everything done. Yes. Did it all happen? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Without them, you know, the world will be a much poorer place. And it was so interesting too, to read how after the war, everybody thought the resistance was peopled by men and that men were the lifeblood of the French resistance. When you look at all of the stories and it was the women who were the lifeblood because the men were either prisoners of war or they'd been sent to Germany for the service de travail obligatoire. And so it was the women who were curing messages around the country and spying on the Nazis and ferrying people um, through the Alps and back to, to London and, and that sort of thing. Um, not so much the men who were doing, who were working, you know, bravely as well, but in other capacities. And then we have Elliot's brother, who I was quite annoyed with him. I'm going to talk about his effect in moving the narrative along. Yeah, so Eliane has a brother called Luc, who she adores. He's a, an aspiring artist, although he prefers to spend more time in the cafes of Montparnasse than he does with his oils on canvas. Um, but it was interesting. I was, in fact, talking with another author recently, and we said that mostly when we're writing fiction, we tend to not give our characters large families and, and parents because when you're trying to unravel family secrets, a big cast of characters can kind of get in the way. Um, and I said, oh, this is the first time I've, you know, Eliane's got four sisters, one brother, um, a mother and father at the start of the book. And it was really interesting to unravel the familial obligations that yeah. you felt during the Second World War, particularly in late 1942, when the Nazis introduced a law that basically said that if they were to arrest anyone who was engaged in resistance activities, their whole family would be deemed to be guilty also. So their whole family would be imprisoned and they would all be killed. And so the burden that uh, placed on someone like Eliane or her brother Luke to know that it wasn't just themselves that they were having to protect within their resistance activities, it was all the people connected to them because they would all be swept up by the Nazis if either of them was to be found, was to be caught resisting the Germans. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, in Anne Service book where I read about Rose Vallon, she talks about women who collaborated with the Nazis or were seen to collaborate and women who resisted. And, you know, you wonder how many decisions a Parisian had to make every single day about how, who to smile at and who to talk to and what to do because any, you know, not smiling at a German could be seen as resisting. And therefore, if you did that, you're putting your whole family in jeopardy and maybe you have small children to look after. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard to imagine what it would have been like to live knowing that every single thing you did over every single day could cause such yes. immense repercussions to flow down onto your family and friends and loved ones. So, um, so that's kind of part of what I'm exploring in the book as well with Eliane and Luke and their sister Angelique, who was also working with the Maquis in the countryside um, to help look after the Mona Lisa who's hiding in a chateau down in the French countryside, um, which was fun to write about as well. <laughs> um, I wanted to also ask you a little bit about um, whether you were able to speak to family members of some of the women you wrote about um, and how they responded to you writing about these women's stories. Were they um, largely open and excited to have someone writing about them? Did they know about these women's? Because I know sometimes even family don't know what the women in their family did. Did they all know about these women's achievements? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think there's a, a little bit of a, a legacy for many of them. For example, the woman who was the nurse, had she and her husband had seven children. Mm -hmm. So they're Three of their sons served in the mil U.S. military, two in Vietnam, one in Af Afghanistan, and a granddaughter who served in Iraq. So there is a legacy of service there. But I would ask them questions. I, I was primarily speaking to one daughter, and I would say, so how did your parents meet up again after the war? Because she was in Europe, he was in Japan, and there was this silence for weeks. And I thought, oh, I must have offended someone. Mm -hmm. Well, they had to have a family conference between all seven of them and then come to agree that nobody knew the answer, mm -hmm. that she had never told them the story. You know, he had died several years earlier, so they didn't know how. And then there was the consternation of why don't we know this mm -hmm. story? So it was interesting to see how their impacts have continued and carried on in the legacy that they created. 
Mm. So, so the quote in the beginning of the book from <clears throat> Alex Borstein, as she receives the Emmy in 2019 about step out of line. Mm. When I talked to Mary Taylor Previty's daughter, Mary was the girl in the concentration camp in China. And her daughter said, well, this was earlier in August. She said, yes, next week is VJ Day, the victory over Japan. But to me, that will always be Liberation Day because if my mother hadn't been liberated, I wouldn't be here now. Mm -hmm. And it just recalled that to me. So, mm -hmm. so many of the sentiments, I think, are the same. So mm -hmm. even as I read your story, it is the same. It mm -hmm. is the same sentiments. It is the same sense of legacy. It is this is what the grandparents did and look at how it lives on in our lives today. Mm -hmm. And that is what I found really the most striking. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so actually I'm going to put this aside and I'm going to go read it again, maybe right before <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I love most about writing historical fiction is, you know, in some ways you're talking about, you know, look at these things that happened in the past and sometimes look how much we've changed, but also, look how much is still here in the present of those things that happened in the past. You know, they, we think they happened 70 or 80 years ago, but they're actually still happening right now. And, and even to the point of, you know, um, in the newspapers recently, there've been quite a few stories about artworks that have been recently recovered that mm -hmm. were been missing since the second world war. Um, families have been searching for them and they turn up at auction houses all the time. So, um, you know, even that story is still resonating on into our into our present now. It's all just beneath the surface. All of that is still here. And I think for many people today, they think, oh, World War II, that's back there with the pyramids. That's mm. far, no. far, and it's not. It's just yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, have we got any questions from the audience, Mary Elizabeth? I don't want to um, ignore any anyone's questions. So, they so Colleen <laughs> would like to know what you all think of the suggestion of perhaps doing some sort of collaborative work uh, tackling Nazi gold. <sighs> Yes, I've heard a few stories about the Nazi gold and um, there, there's, isn't there that story about a whole lot of gold being uh, lost in a, in a lake somewhere and nobody knows whether yeah. it, it really is in the lake or whether it was actually sent on a train somewhere. There are lots of stories and, and you know, myths and ideas that surround that, you know, like you were saying with Alice Marvel, so often people don't know what's fact and what's fiction, which is kind of nice, I guess, for a novelist, because it means you can kind of take some creative license there. But I don't think anyone will ever really know. I mean, yes, there are records and, and you know, as writers, both of us have spent time talking to archivists and diving into archives, but they only tell you the things that people chose to write down. There's a whole lot of stuff always that people did yes. not choose to write down. And it's in those gaps, actually, that often the most interesting story lies, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I lived in Germany for five years. So mm -hmm. in the little town where I lived, there were lots of stories about Nazi gold because some of it did come from the Reichsbank yeah. in Berlin yes. down through there. So lots of stories about it being buried in lakes or hillsides mm -hmm. or stolen and it would make it would make a great story and that's one of the other things I've been working on is next next will be the fiction piece that takes on some of that oh great can't wait to read that one <laughs> and and do you I mean obviously Natasha maybe has a little bias towards this but but do you think that maybe um the benefit of some of the historical fiction is that for the lost stories, at least we have ways of experiencing things that kind of fill in the gaps, you know, even, even if some of the women in the fictional books are, are imaginary, perhaps it's an experience that would be similar to something someone had that we just don't know about. I do. And it, it, the other thing it does is give us an ending or a resolution or mm -hmm. a legacy into today that satisfies our need to see some of these things worked out in a way that seems correct or logical or appropriate or even, I don't know, 
victorious in many ways. And we want to see these things happen. And we're so happy when good people make it and good things happen to them. Mm, absolutely. And I think it's just, you know, it's a way of making these women's stories accessible to so many people. And that's one of the things I love about writing these books and, and receiving messages from readers who afterwards say, oh, I spent, you know, hours researching Rose Valland or looking yeah. up the paintings that you mentioned in your book or in the Paris Secret, my last book, researching Catherine Dior. And to me, that's the that's the best thing that um, my book wasn't enough for them. They wanted to then go and find out as much more as they could about those women. And, you know, that's my job done. I, I want people to know about these women. So the more they want to find out, I think that's just wonderful. Like there's no greater compliment, I think, to a writer than to hear that. Well, that worked on me and I did research, <laughs> research them afterwards too. <laughs> Uh, do either of you have something that you discovered in the course of your research for this book that you just, you remain intrigued by, but you just couldn't work it into the book? Oh, so many things. Um, I had a whole extra section in, I had lots of whole extra sections, but I had one. <laughs> um, so the Mona Lisa painting does play a part in the Riviera house, um, her evacuation from the Louvre in 1939. And she was then moved through various chateaux in France to keep her safe. Um, and so I had quite a lot more in the book about that because I was fascinated by the idea of these artworks being evacuated out of the Louvre. You know, there's a one uh, scene in the book where Eliane and Luke, her brother, are watching the Winged Victory be kind of winched down that massive Daru staircase mm. at the Louvre and are literally holding their breath thinking, oh gosh, what if she falls over and, and crashes and, and is broken? What kind of symbol would that mean for us now on the eve of war? Um, but so there were other stories about the Mona Lisa that I couldn't put in. I tried to put in, but it was just, it was going to be too much. So there's one in particular where she was being transported between two different chateaux because the one she was staying at, um, Loc Dieu, it was an abbey down in the south of France. It, the climate became too humid there and, and she, because the Mona Lisa was painted on wood, not canvas, and the wood was starting to crack and bend in the humidity. And so they were moving her to a different chateau. And to do that, to protect her from the humidity, they put her in the back of a hermetically sealed van. But they also put a curator in the back of the van with the painting to make sure it didn't get knocked on the journey. And so when the van arrived at the next chateau and they opened up this hermetically sealed van, the curator had passed out from lack of oxygen. <laughs> And I just thought, oh, my God, those people were extraordinary, those curators who slept with the Mona Lisa next to their bedside. You see photographs in the Musée National Archives of beds pushed up against crates of all the Louvre artworks that are they're protecting and looking after, you know, rooms in chateaus filled with all the artworks that are being protected there. So all of that, I had bits and pieces of that in there that I just had to cut out in the end because I couldn't fit it into the book, but it was so fascinating and so extraordinary. So I had mentioned Stephanie Chet and having learned a little bit more about her story before she went to Poland. And when she was in Austria, she went to the Salzburg Music Festival. And that evening she was at the castle where General Mark Clark was. He was then the commanding general of occupation forces in Austria. And he would have in other allied leaders as they recovered art and returned it to those countries. So I had found all of the photos of him showing some of this recovered art to uh, his Russian counterparts, the French counterparts, the Austrians, and having some of it be returned. Now, Stephanie was there for that. And at that party that evening, she had said something to General Clark about, why don't you have any music? So he brings in the orchestra and he had asked her something about, where did you, how did you get here this evening? And she said, well, I have a staff car. You what? Where did you get that? Well, I appropriated it. <laughs> oh, and where do you get fuel for this? Um, well, here and there. You're using fuel that my troops need. I'm going to find that car and I'll take it from you. And she said, you'll never find it. And he didn't. So I wish I'd had that story to add it in because that was pretty oh. bold of her. Oh, absolutely. I love and that. He one never story. did find that car. She kept it. 
Oh, good on her. <laughs> Probably at the bottom of the lake with the German gold. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> right in the trunk. <laughs> oh, well, this has been amazing. So the traditional final question is, if each of us, if each of you could tell us a little bit about what it is that you're in process on now. I know, Natasha, you mentioned you're working on something for either next fall or early 2023. And Mary, you suggested that maybe fiction might be in your future. Well, here is another World War II story that I found that just fascinated me. I did not know that there was a Russian general who was captured by the Nazis and then was permitted by Hitler to form his own army of Russian POWs to fight for Germany. So he was going to the camps, the POW camps, and getting Russian soldiers to enlist in his new army. And Hitler fully approved of this, didn't give them weapons, but he said it was a good idea to have this army. So they were signing up in 1944 at the rate of 50,000 a day out of the camps. And by January of 1945, that army was 900,000 men strong. Wow. So I, I have, a, I, and of course there's some Nazi gold in there. I had to do that, but <laughs> it's coming together. <laughs> And Natasha, remind us what you're working on. Um, so I am working on a book which at this moment doesn't have a title. We're still in the process of working out what that will be called. Um, but it is a story about, um, so Christian Dior, when he set up his fashion house, he surrounded himself with women. Um, he had four women in his kind of the, the top roles in the couture house and one man, an American who was his public relations director. And I thought, it's fiction. I'm going to move the man, male public relations director to one side, and I'm going to put a woman in there in his place. So I've invented a character who serves as Christian Dior's director of public relations um, for the opening of the Couture House in 1947. And so as well as being about the experience of women post-war, it's also about the golden age of fashion journalism um, and the magazines Harper's Bazaar and Vogue during um, in that period, the 1940s and, and 1950s. And so some famous fashion editors like Carmel Snow um, make um, appearances and are characters in the story, as well as lots of beautiful gowns, of course. But there is also a Second World War storyline through Switzerland and Italy, um, which are areas I don't think are written about that much in fiction mm -hmm. during the Second World War. So that was quite fascinating to explore what happened in neutral Switzerland and in the in northern Italy with the Italian partisans during the Second World War. And I think an important reminder that, you know, it wasn't just necessarily those well-known fronts that, that we focus on so often. Absolutely. So. Well, thank you both so much for making time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate this. Um, unlike last year when we had Natasha visit for the Paris Secret, I actually have successfully recorded this, so I will be able to post it later, I am delighted to say. Um, and uh, thank you all to everyone who joined us, and, um, and thank you for supporting our authors with uh, the book orders and uh, I wish everyone a very good night slash day. Thank you so much for having us and thank you so much everyone who watched, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much.